Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers and this presentation is titled The Crew Flew Exactly As They Were Trained and Everyone Died. So many errors led to this accident. American Airlines Flight 191. Now, on the left is an old um, O'Hare approach plate. Actually, it's, um, it's more recent than when this accident, which occurred in May 25th, 1979. I was um, getting out of the Air Force. In fact, I was hired by United Airlines in August of 1979. And I remember being actually at the maintenance desk coming back from a maintenance test flight on the T-38. And uh, one of the mechanics there say, hey, did you hear there was an accident at uh, Chicago? And that was uh, that was this accident. Now, the yellow arrow points to 3-2 right. I have taken off on this runway many times in many different aircraft. Um, including the DC-10. And the red arrow shows basically uh, where they crashed. Now, um, the diagram on the right is a more current, is, as of uh, this video, is the most current uh, chart of O'Hare. And they've added a lot of runways and made modifications. And my good old 3-2 right is gone. 3-2 right at the time of this accident and through a lot of my career was the longest runway at O'Hare. If you needed a long runway, this was your runway, of course, 3-2 right in the reciprocal. Now, a lot of the problems with this accident uh, go back to training, unfortunately. The crew did exactly as they were trained, and the crew was not sighted in this accident. There were a number of things that led to this accident, but the crew was not sighted. Now, this is out of my DC-10 manual, and it deals with engine failure on takeoff. And, of course, um, this is after the, uh, the accident actually occurred. And our manual, and I'm sure theirs now, says if the engine failure occurs after V2, up to it including V2 plus 10, and we have uh, later developed on aircraft procedures of above uh, engine failure above V2, and, and actually it could be more difficult to fly an engine failure uh, above V2. But anyway, if the engine failure occurs, maintain the airspeed that existed when the engine failure occurred until reaching, you know, where you start to clean it up. Now, uh, there's an old saying among fighter pilots, speed is life. And in this situation, uh, speed is life would have been critical. It, it would have actually saved them. Now, the crew had a lot going against them. This is the aircraft uh, taxiing out uh, to 3 2 right. Um, it crashed less than one mile from the end of the runway. And all 258 passengers, 13 crew members on board were killed, along with two unfortunate uh, people working in a garage off the, uh, the uh, maintenance type of facility, uh, automobile garage, I believe, off the end of the runway. So it was 273 fatalities all in all. Now, as you probably know, um, this was a maintenance failure that, that led to this accident, the uh, uh, they used non-FAA-approved procedures for removing the engine and pylon together, and it damaged the pylon, uh, which resulted in a failure of the pylon. Uh, there was an eyewitness that said they could actually see the engine bouncing up and down as the airplane was going to the runway. Of course, the crew uh, can't see the wings, can't see the engine, and uh, this separated. Now, one thing American used to do is they used to have a camera in the cockpit, and they would show on the screen uh, back in the passenger cabins um, what the pilots were seeing. And, of course, um, a situation like this is very unfortunate. Now, as they rotated and this engine tore off, uh, of course, it took the whole engine with it. It took the hydraulic pumps. It took the generators. And the number one AC bus failed. And they also had a uh, hydraulic uh, failure. And the slats um, on that side retracted. Now, part of the problem on this, uh, as they were climbing out, is uh, that in losing that number one AC bus, they lost the stick shaker, the stall indication, on the left side of the aircraft, on the on the captain's uh, uh, um, yoke there, on his stick, as it were. There's a little motor down there with an off-center weight, off weight that vibrates. The motor runs, it vibrates, and it shakes the stick pretty violently. 
Now, American Airlines went kind of cheap and they decided, well, only one on the left side. Well, uh, so, and that one was tied to the number one bus. So when the number one bus went, there was no stall warning. The co-pilot uh, would have been powered by a different AC bus and his would have his would have actually operated. So if American had spent the money uh, for the uh, complete stall warning system, which are now uh, mandated on uh, on both sides, um, he the pilot would have at least had some stall warning. Also, uh, what was lost, uh, and that's the yellow arrow here, is the slat disagree light. Now, okay, airplanes are a lot better now with ECAM and ICAS. You know, Boeing, Airbus, it's it's a lot better. Uh, Annunciation system, but uh, this aircraft has uh, things scattered all over the place as far as as warnings and that. So they lost two critical factors here. They lost um, stall warning, all stall warning, and they had no idea that the uh, the slats uh, were in a disagreement position because the ones on the left side um, had actually retracted. And here's a picture of the pilot's enunciator panel, and yes, it's uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty busy there, is it? Isn't it? And this is the uh, uh, flap indicator and the uh, the disagree light that I had in the uh, previous picture there on the right center. Uh, that light illuminated. And just for completeness, this is um, the uh, information that the uh, uh, second officer has back on his panel. All right, now here's the hydraulic system, and there's hydraulic system number one with the uh, orange arrow there. And if you read down all the stuff they lose, uh, it says all slats. Now, part of the problem on this design, um, and not all aircraft had, had it at the time, most aircraft, when you extended the slats, they locked in position, and then it took hydraulic power to unlock them. And the whole reason for this was if for any reason you lost hydraulic power, the slats didn't automatically retract. Well, when they lost hydraulic uh, power, the slats did automatically retract. Now, um, they, they had a leak in the system because they tore the lines, and they also lost some of the control cables. Uh, those of you familiar with the DC-10, you can see in the, uh, the diagram down there, there's a motor pump. So number three hydraulic system can power number one hydraulic system, which it did, and number two hydraulic system was, was unharmed, although there was some damage to number three because number three is also powering um, areas of the wing near that. Now here's something else that you could not get by today. This is um, out of my book for the electrical panel, and yeah, it's like all these things. It's fairly complicated here, but... Um, when the captain lost his power, and he lost his flight instruments, um, you actually had to get up and uh, the second officer, uh, because of the size of the cockpit, he had virtually had to come out of his seat um, to reach this switch, or the captain could, but he's kind of busy at the time. They only had 31 seconds of flight before they impacted, from when they lifted off to when they impacted. So uh, it was a little short for the, uh, the second officer to get up there and try messing with his switch, uh, but he would have had to turn it on. Of course, you can't do that nowadays, uh, like on the 727 or that. It doesn't um, require somebody to turn a switch. It's all automatic. In fact, um, when I was involved in the uh, the 777, that had so many, uh, well, it was ETOPS, that had so many uh, power systems and crossovers and protections, it was ridiculous. I, I joked with them on a conference call, Boeing, one time on a conference call, that I said, you know, the only thing I see missing here is that the uh, coffee maker isn't run by the uh, RAT, the uh, Ram Air Turbine. You know, I said, you guys just cover about everything else. But Sorry, I digress. Now let's let's get back to um, the whole flight and training issue. All right, now let's get back to the training situation. Like I said, the crew did exactly as they were trained. The co-pilot was flying. The co-pilot had his bus. He had all his instruments. The captain lost his instruments, but it doesn't really matter. The co-pilot, in this case, was flying, and he had all the information he needed. He had a good working attitude indicator. He had his instruments. And he had a flight director. Uh, the only thing he did not have was a stall indication and, um, of course, a, a awareness of the uh, slat situation that they uh, were in a disagreement uh, situation, which would have, would have told him uh, something was wrong there. And, of course, all this happens pretty fast. You rotate, and as you rotate, that slung the engine up over. Um, and he pulled up um, initial pitch attitude, um, 
to about 14 degrees and uh he was he was um they never got more than 325 feet in the air but he was doing 165 knots and he was a little bit above the takeoff safely speed the v2 of 153 knots okay he's fast now because the slats were gone that raised the stall speed to 159 knots okay so if he had maintained the 165 and flew out with that he would have been above the stall speed and what he did though uh, as he was trained he slowed back to v2 speed of 153 knots okay six knots below stall speed and the aircraft stalled and rolled over and the aircraft crashed off of the end of the runway and of course like i mentioned there was a, a maintenance garage down there two people in the garage uh, unfortunately were killed now here's a diagram of the the pylon there and uh, american airlines was using an unapproved procedure well the faa didn't need to approve the procedure but they were using uh, a procedure that had not been approved and uh, the maintenance procedure that McDonnell Douglas uh, prescribed was that you take the engine off the pylon, then you take the pylon off. Well, they could save 200 hours of maintenance time if they kept the whole thing in one unit with the engine and pylon. Uh, United Airlines was actually doing something similar at the time, but they were using an overhead hoist. American was using a forklift. And they were replacing uh, this engine, and in the process, um, they had a shift change, and the... Um, the uh, forklift was left there but the pressure bled off a little bit and it caused the pylon to sag and this damaged um, the uh, aft um, wing clevis point which caused which caused the uh, the failure and of course there was um, a rush to judgment on this everybody wants to know of course right away what happens and there, there's an old error, and, and my wife will off and ask me, says, well, what do you think caused it? What do you think caused it? And I'll go, you know, you try not to guess quickly. You know, yeah, okay, maybe there's a few things that, that might seem to point it, but um, those who try to guess an accident problem early are usually the wrong ones. And here's our good old Illinois uh, FAA Administrator Langhorn Bond, who thoroughly embarrassed himself on this because... On the runway, they found this attach bolt for the pylon, and it had sheared. So that's it. It was a bolt failure. The bolt had failed, and that's why the engine came off and, um, and uh, resulted in the accident. Well, no, that wasn't why the bolt failed. The bolt failed because it was stressed during this uh, process that was really not appropriate. Now, there was one final fatality um, in this that is often overlooked, and they were going to dispose an Earl Russell Marshall, who was um, the crew chief at American Airlines Maintenance Facility um, the following day. And the, um, the night before um, he was to be disposed, he committed suicide. So if American Airlines and, of course, United had not been using an unapproved maintenance procedure, if the electrical system was better designed, if um, American Airlines had paid for both uh, stall warning systems, left and right, if the slats had been designed so they didn't retract with a loss of hydraulic pressure, and if the crew had kept their airspeed and continued to fly with higher airspeed, um, and not slowing to V2, the aircraft, uh, the accident, uh, would have been prevented. In fact, the, the unfortunate simple fact that if the aircraft uh, crew would have kept their speed, um, they would have made it around. Uh, such a small error, the crew did exactly what they were trained to do, and that's what led to their and all the passengers' demise and people on the ground and the maintenance chief. Thanks for watching. Hope you found it informative.